Hello, everybody. Hey, before we get started, if I can get everyone to make sure that your doors are shut and all your other devices are turned off, I'm going to cover quite a bit of information in a short period of time, so I do need your full attention. Also, please know that everyone on this call will receive a copy of this training material at the end of the broadcast. Uh, my name is Chris Stuffield, and I'm an account executive for New Line Mortgage. And this class is part of a series of classes designed for loan officers that are either new to VA purchase loans or just need a refresher. Uh, for about the next 30 minutes, we're going to talk about employment and income guidelines. We'll review some of the underwriting guidelines um, and discuss some of the documentation requirements that go with the guidelines. Uh, the goal of this training is to get you comfortable calculating income and documenting that your borrower meets employment and income guidelines established by the Veterans Administration. Also, before we get started, I'd like to take a moment and ask you for your business. As an AE, I'm paid commission, so the best compliment you can give me is to send me a loan. If you find this training useful and learn something new, please send me a loan on any product. Uh, New Line does offer some great FHA, VA, conventional, and USDA pricing right now. Also, I have many other trainings available on all of our different products and our different services. Uh, if you need anything or have any questions, please don't hesitate, hesitate to contact me. All right, let's get started. So VA, Purchase, Employment, and Income Analysis. The borrower's employment and income for the last two years must be documented. There is only one exception to this, and this is in regards to tax returns only. If you run LP, not DU, just LP, and if LP only requires one year of tax returns, then New Line will require the same. So tax returns are typically required for your self-employed or your commissioned borrower. If you've entered your data correctly and LP is only requiring the one return, we will honor that guideline. Um, if you're working with a non-permanent resident alien, then you need to make sure that those guys have been employed in the U.S. or in the U.S. military for the previous two years. Those are a couple things you need to note on employment and income. When working with employment and income, here are some acceptable documentation guidelines. So you can provide a written verification of employment. It's actually required in some cases. Um, we always require pay stubs and W-2s on every loan. Uh, we, we won't waive that requirement, but like I said, sometimes you need a written VOE. We'll go through those uh, guidelines here in just a minute. Uh, this must be sent to the employer directly and returned to the loan processor directly. The borrower cannot be involved in this process. So that written VOE needs to be on a Fannie Mae form. Actually, it can be on a different form as long as it has the same information. Um, but yeah, make sure you're mailing that or faxing it or emailing it directly to the employer and receiving that directly back from the employer. Uh, don't get the borrower involved in that process. Uh, verbal verifications of employment. This must identify the name of the person who made the contact, identify the employer, and the name of the person contacted. Show the date of contact and the source of the phone number, and it must confirm that the borrower is currently employed. That's all we're looking for on a verbal verification of employment, is the borrower is currently employed. Uh, most recent pay stubs for previous 30 days. These must be computer generated or typed. They cannot be handwritten. In addition, the pay stubs must identify the employer, the borrower as an employee, show the time period covered, and provide year-to-date earnings. Um, W-2s, that's another form of employment and income documentation. We'll always need those for the previous two years. Uh, you may need to provide personal federal tax returns for one to two years. Make sure they match our transcripts. And you could need business federal tax returns for one to two years. And again, those must match the transcripts. If your employer utilizes a payroll service company, uh, we can work with that. Um, we'll need verification of income through the use of pay stubs and W-2s. 
um, which we require pretty much on every loan anyway. So we just need to be able to link that payroll service company to our employer. It needs to be obvious that uh, the employer uses a payroll services company and um, we may need maybe a letter of explanation from the employer or the CPA if it's not obvious. So those are some of the documentation requirements you may be asked to meet. When analyzing income, you kind of want to start out and take an overall view of the income and see if we've got some kind of a pattern, whether it's an overall decrease in the income or perhaps an overall increase in the income. In either case, you may not be able to um, take the current income. Well, let's start out with the decreased income. So the income cannot be averaged using a high, excuse me, the income cannot be averaged using a previous higher level unless there is documentation of a one-time occurrence that prevented the borrower from working or earning full income for a period of time and proof that the borrower is back to the income amount that they previously earned. So what's, what that is saying is if you've got a two-year history and the most previous year is less than the year before, then we're probably just going to take an average of that previous year's income. We're probably not going to take an average of two years uh, just because we have a decrease in income unless you're documenting maybe the borrower had a work injury, um, had a leave of absence, and of course has been back on the job long enough. You know, there are certain circumstances that can pop up that warrant a decrease in income. Uh, you you want to take a look at that. You know, we may have to analyze that situation uh, in helping us to determine if we're going to take an average of income or use current income only. If we're working with an overall increase in income, the higher income may not be used to qualify the borrower unless there is sufficient documentation to determine the increase is stable and likely to continue at the level used for qualifying. So again, um, overall increase in income. If the last year is significantly higher than previous years, then you may be asked to document that. Perhaps the borrower received a raise. That's an obvious uh, reason for an increase in income. Perhaps their hours increased. Uh, perhaps their level of commission increased. Maybe they were at a level where they earned you know, a smaller percentage of commission and now they earn a larger percentage. Those are all examples of how income can increase. Again, we have to analyze the overall situation and to help us determine are we going to be able to use just the current income or do we have to take a two-year average. You definitely you know, want to make sure that you have an understanding of what the last two years look like and why. Obviously, if it's stable, then, or a slight increase or a slight decrease, you know, there's really nothing to worry about in those regards. So make sure you're looking at it, taking an overall view of the income and see if there's a pattern developing, um, because an underwriter will question that. In terms of employment, when you're looking at an, um, uh, the employment history, if the borrower's employment changed over the past two years, verification must be obtained from the previous employer as well as the current employer. So we're verifying two years of employment, and uh, that includes current and previous. Uh, gaps in employment need to be addressed. So the borrower must provide a letter of explanation for any gaps in employment over 30 days. Gaps between 30 and 90 days may require a 30 to 180 days at their current employer, depending on the reason. Significant gaps should be reviewed by an underwriter during the pre-qualification process. So again, you know, take a look at the overall picture for the last two years. If you've got a gap in employment, 30 days or less, maybe they were just in between jobs, you know, pretty much a no-brainer. Once we start exceeding 30 days in gaps of employment, then an underwriter is going to start questioning that, and it's going to need to make sense, um, you know, what the, what the reason was. If you have a newly employed borrower with less than a two-year employment history, 
Um, they should provide documentation showing that immediately prior to the current job, the borrower was maybe attending school or in a training program. You know, so we've got some leeway for, for people entering the workforce. Um, if the borrower is re-entering the workforce, provide documentation to support that the borrower has been at the current employment for a minimum of six months and documentation to show a previous two-year work history. So that's for your borrower who has an extended gap. Like if they have a gap of employment of 180 days or six months, they probably will need to be back at their current job for six months and will want to document a two-year history prior to that. You know, if, if they were out of the workforce for like 60, 90, 120 days, you know, we're going to look for the reason. Is it common for the industry? Um, did it make sense? It's just something that we need to put in front of an underwriter during the pre-qualification process to make sure um, your borrower is going to meet the guidelines. If there's multiple gaps in employment or frequent changes in employment within the past 24 months, those should be carefully reviewed to determine if the borrower's employment is stable and likely to continue. Um, for self-employed borrowers, no gaps are allowed. So, you know, some industries uh, do warrant frequent job changes. Um, some do not. So, again, you know, get this in front of an underwriter if you're uncertain about the employment history and let us help you make a determination uh, before you process the loan. Okay, calculating the income. So for a salary or an hourly base income, you've got different calculations depending on how the borrower is paid. To help better demonstrate this, we have a worksheet that everybody will get a copy of, you have access to. This worksheet will actually allow you to enter your borrower information. So you can put in the new line loan number, your borrower, you know, what they do for employment. And what I highly recommend is that you print this and include it with your loan file and, and show your underwriter how you've calculated the income and, and have, how you've analyzed the income. And, and this will actually go a long ways with the underwriter. If you set this sheet in on every loan with all the income figures calculated, then um, they, they will love you. <laughs> Because a lot of times there's questions, you know, on how income was derived. And the more information you give them and answer those questions up front, of course, the less questions they're going to have for you and the less conditions you're going to get. And, you know, instead of suspending a file, they might just call you and talk over the file with you and, and um, just get a lot better service. So let's see. So you can complete the top of the form there, um, and then you can come down here to this, this section and complete the income based on how the borrower is paid. So if the borrower receives an annual salary, then you plug that annual salary in, it'll divide it by 12, and it'll give you your monthly calculation here. If they're paid monthly, you put that calculation in. If they're paid semi-monthly, put that calculation in. Over here, it's putting it into a monthly calculation for you. Oops. I'm going to go ahead and put these in. So on the hourly, make sure you're putting in the hourly wage and the hours work per week. Okay. So it's pretty easy. Helps you calculate your income. And then what's really neat is if you come down here, this is going to help you analyze the income. 
and take a look at the last two years like we just talked about. So you come down here and you complete the year to date and past year earnings. You know, it's easy if you've got a salary or an hourly borrower. You can come in here and, and put your year to date figures in. So maybe you've got 30,000 year to date and it's six months into the year. Um, maybe last year. Oops, well, we would all love to earn that. So maybe the last year they earned 48000 and the year before that they earned 45000 So, you know, under a scenario like this, you've got slightly increasing income. You know, we're, we're most likely going to take current income. We'll just want to document that perhaps the borrower has received a raise, you know, in the last 12 months, and that's why their income is slightly higher this year as opposed to previous years. You know, if you get into something like this, let's say they're already at 50000 this year. You know, we've got quite a substantial increase in income. We'll definitely, you know, want some solid documentation above and beyond a, uh, a written verification of employment. We we'll probably want something from, like a letter of explanation from the employer or maybe some other supporting documentation, you know, as to why such a huge increase. It could be maybe in the first couple of years they were at an entry level position. Uh, maybe they were even like a paralegal or something like that. They passed the bar, now they're an attorney, you know, and they're earning higher income. That's just one example I can think of off the top of my head. There's every loan's unique and every loan has its specific examples, but you know, sometimes we have to go above and beyond documenting the borrower received a raise. We need to document why they received that raise, depending on what kind of an increase in income we're talking about. And then down here under the commission piece, so on commission income, we're, we're pretty much taking a two-year average. You're not allowed to take a current income. Um, however, you know, if their, if their commission income is decreased, then we might take their current income. Um, but if it's, their commission's increased, probably won't take their current income. We'll probably use the, the, the two-year average. So under this scenario, you come in here, maybe they've earned 50000 We'll just kind of plug in the same numbers, make it easy. Maybe this is how their commissions look like, what their commissions look like, excuse me. What their commissions look like for the past couple of years. So what you've got, you know, we've got a slightly higher average this year, a little bit lower the year before, and even a little bit lower the year before that. And then when you take an average of the past 30, year, 30 months, we're using $4,100 a month. That's most likely what we're going to use um, in this scenario. Uh, we could make a case maybe for taking a, just a straight 24-month average rather than a 30-month average. If we can make a case to support, you know, higher uh, year-to-date commission income. Uh, like I said, maybe the borrower is now receiving, maybe, you know, they started out with a 10% commission split, and now they're at a 20% commission split. And something like that needs to be based on tenure. It can't be volume-based, because if they dip below the volume threshold, then, of course, they're going to take a lower split. So, you know, sometimes they earn uh, more commission based on, on tenure, you know, or length of employment. Um, that could be one example. Um, but this, as you can see, is just a quick, easy, great overall view of the last two years of income. And over time, pretty much, you know, it does, it does work the same. So in, in calculating overtime income, you, know, you would come in here and, and, and calculate the amount of the overtime. You know, pretty much the same way. You plug in the figures. You know, if your year-to-date overtime or commission is significantly less, 
let's say you're working with a scenario where it's significantly less, you know, we're more than likely going to take a 24-month average and, or excuse me, a 30-month average and, and use that figure. Excuse me, let me backtrack a little bit. We're probably going to use the current figure. Oops, I just messed that up. Probably going to use the current figure and, um, and go with that unless we can make a case as to why we should use a higher average uh, of income. So if, if their current income is you know, much lower on commission or overtime, I am just messing this chart up, aren't I? So we'll come back up here. So if this is significantly less than the previous two months, we're probably going to go with the year-to-date earnings unless we can make a case as to why. Maybe it's a one-time glitch um, and you know, we might need letters of explanation from the employer or other supporting documentation. But you get the gist of this worksheet and how it can be a useful tool. Um, if you ever do what I just did and mess up the calculation, just email me and I can, I'll always have a copy of this worksheet available and you can uh, get the most recent copy from me. Okay, so on a salary or hourly borrower, we're going to require the most recent pay stubs from the previous 30 days and we're going to require the most recent W-2s for the previous two years. Okay, That will be what we require on a minimum for a salary or an hourly employee. If they are earning overtime, the borrower must have a two-year consecutive history of receiving overtime income and the income must be likely to continue for the next three years. The borrower's overall income should be evaluated using the hourly rate, the number of hours worked, to develop an average of overtime earned to determine the amount that is most likely to continue for the next three years. The loan file must contain an analysis of the income used to qualify. So that would be the uh, income analysis we just used. What you're going to be required to provide is a written VOE for the full two years. And it does need to indicate that overtime is likely to continue. Or the most recent year-to-date pay stub covering 30 days, W-2s for the most recent two years, and the employer must verify that the overtime, overtime income is likely to continue. They can simply provide a letter. If you don't want to get a full written VOE, they can provide a letter. Bonus. When bonus income is used as qualifying income, the borrower must have a two-year consecutive history of receiving bonus income. You're going to be required to provide a written VOE, your pay stubs, and your W-2s. Verification that bonus income is expected to continue either in a written VOE or in a separate statement. So pretty much the same documentation requirements as your overtime. When you're dealing with commission income, when commission income is used for qualifying income, the borrower must have a two-year consecutive history of receiving commission income, and the income must be likely to continue for the next three years. That's, that's pretty much impl implied as far as you're going to see this a lot in guidelines, is income has to continue for the next three years. Basically, the whole reason for going back the last two years and gathering the documentation that we do is you know, not just to come up with an income figure, you know, but documenting the income and its history and the employment and its history and taking an overall view and analysis is we're kind of making sure that over the next three years they've got, uh, they're in a stable enough job and a stable enough market, um, you know, with a make sense history so, so that we know for the next three years that they're going to be able to make their mortgage payment. It's kind of the window that the underwriter is looking at. You know, it's a, underwriting loan is a snapshot in time for sure. You know, uh, borrower scenarios change for, sh for sure. Um, but the, the one thing that they like to see, you know, and why they don't waive on, so you can't get away with a one-year employment history or a six-month employment history. They want the two years because if they've maintained a two-year history of employment and income, 
then it's likely that you know, they're going to be able to maintain that same level of employment and income for at least the next three years. So that's kind of why you never get away with less than a two-year history. And so anyway, you're going to see this guideline you know, throughout the training that it has to continue for the next three years. It's really just implied in most cases that it will continue if we get the proper documentation, except for the overtime and bonus. You know, those are the two types of incomes the employer has to state is likely to continue. So on this commission income, um, you will need a written VOE for the full two years with a breakout detailing the commission income, um, or the most recent year-to-date pay stub covering the last 30 days with a breakout detailing the commission income. So if your pay stub breaks it out, you don't need the written VOE. You know, and, and written VOEs, or excuse, excuse, yeah, written VOEs and pay stubs, you definitely want to compare the two when, when it starts breaking down or giving details of the different types of income. Uh, sometimes with pay stubs it's really easy and you don't need a VOE. Sometimes pay stubs kind of lump income together. Even VOEs lump income together. So you have to compare the two and make sure you're looking at all the different types of income to make sure they match. And then you'll need the W-2s and 1099s for the re most recent two years. And then, um, of course, we're going to need complete signed individual federal tax returns for the most recent two years. Um, and also going back to what I was saying about the VOE and the pay stubs, you know, one of, another reason why you want to break out the different types of income is your borrower could earn a base income plus commission income. So that could be two separate income calculations on your loan. They could have just a set base salary that, has, that doesn't change and never will change and has always been there. And then on top of that, they may have commission income. On top of that, they could have even bonus or overtime income. They could have all kinds of income on top of that base. So that's why we get in, when we get into these different income types, we really are looking for a breakout of a, a detailed breakout of all the income sources. When you're working with commission borrowers, employee paid business expenses reflected on the borrower's tax returns must be deducted from the gross commission income when calculating income. So that is exactly why tax returns are required. It's possible a commissioned borrower has unreimbursed employee expenses and those need to be deducted from your income. If your borrower has a part-time or second job, income must be verified as having been uninterrupted for the previous two years with a strong likelihood to continue. Documentation must be on a verification of employment covering two full years or must be supported by W-2 forms and a current pay stub or salary voucher with year-to-date earnings for the most recent 30 days. So part-time and second jobs, you need a two-year history of working either uh, it's just pretty much how it is. Um, if, if a borrower has a full-time job and a part-time job, it's not that they have to have the same part-time job for the last two years, but they do have to have a two-year history of working two jobs with, with no gaps. In this scenario, you can't have gaps. And the reason being is, you know, the lender is trying to make sure that they didn't go out and get a part-time job just to facilitate this loan. This is part of their normal lifestyle and that it's likely to continue for the foreseeable future, at least for the next three years. If your borrower is employed by a relative, a domestic partner, fiancé, or as part of a family business, or perhaps they work for the property seller or the real estate broker, then you need your pay stubs, your W-2s, and we will need signed individual federal tax returns um, or a written VOE. Actually, I'm going to back up. You'll, you'll need tax returns, not or a written VOE. You might need a written VOE in addition to the tax returns, but you're going to need those two years tax returns if they're employed by any of those entities or it's a family-owned business. Definition of self-employment 
So the other piece to this is if your borrower does work for a family business, then they're going to be required to provide a letter probably from the CPA of that family business stating that they are not self-employed. That means they have to own 25% or less of the business. So your CPA letter will need to cover that. If you're working with a borrower who is in manufacturing or um, uh, does piecework, you know, basically maybe on an assembly line or something like that, or they're paid by the units that they produce, then we're looking at a uh, two-year average and pay subs and W-2s are required. A shift differential, that's a little bit like overtime. You need a history of it, two-year history. Um, probably looking for a verification of employment, pay stubs, and W-2s because you need to break out that type of income. Uh, tip income, again, that's averaged over two years. And, of course, we're only using the part of the income that is claimed on the tax returns. And you will need, you know, your pay stubs, your W-2s, your tax returns, probably a VOE. Your retirement income, that's pretty simple. You know, we typically take current awards letters with W-2s or 1099s. You can also provide 12 months bank statements showing the receipt of the income. Um, the non-taxable portion of the income can be grossed up 125%, just so you know that. Okay. Royalty income, you know, if they've sold, if they're published, if they're an author or something, um, that's about the only example I can think of where somebody receives royalty income. You know, we're, we're looking at tax returns and, um, and uh, with the Schedule E because that's where that income is probably going to show and we'll take a two-year average. Social Security. Again, pretty easy to document. We're going with awards letters. And um, you can gross that income up 125% on the non-taxable portion. Those are the most common types of income that I wanted to make sure we cover today. In this training, you've also got foreign income guidelines, temporary income, spousal and child support. Uh, you may want to take a minute and read through the rest of these guidelines. Uh, temporary income, I'll just say real quick, if you've got somebody that works for a tenth service and they've done that for the last couple of years and you can document that even though it's been temporary, they have a history of working temporary jobs for the last two years, you can actually count that as income. Take a two-year average. Child support, of course, we need the divorce decree. It needs to continue for the next three years, and you need to document that it's been received for the last 12 months. Um, you've got notes receivable income. We rarely see that. Dividends and interest income, we rarely see that. You're taking a two-year average of dividends and interest income. The thing to know about uh, dividends and interest income is, you know, typically it comes from an asset, like stocks or savings. If that asset's depleted during the loan process, say for a down payment, then you can't use the dividends and interest income because we don't know what the future holds for that. Um, you can consider automobile allowances uh, as long as they've been received for the last two years. Permanent and temporary disability, we can uh, take a look at using that income as well, or workers' compensation. You can make sure you go through this. This is a great resource to help you with your different income types. And that is all I have for today. Um, again, my name is Chris Duffield, and if you found my training useful, please send me a loan. Uh, contact me with any questions or any additional training requests. I'm at 801-759-8521, or you can email me at kduffield at nlmtg.com. Thanks and have a great day.